Okay, students, so in this present module, we'll be learning certain things about the lids and the lacrimal system. To start with, uh, there is uh, no topic can start without the adequate knowledge of anatomy and physiology of a particular tissue. So, knowing the basics and the concepts will help us understanding the disease process later in world. So, what we do is start with the basic anatomy of the lid. If you can see, this is the structure of the lid consisting of various layers from the skin, the orbicularis, the suborbicularis connective tissue or the neurovascular plane, the, uh, the levator muscles and the tarsoconjunctival layer. So, in all these layers, the particular function is served by each and every one and the, the components that are involved especially in the lid motility are the two ones. The first is the orbicularis oculi and the second one is the levator and the Müller's muscle complex. Now the levator and the Müller's muscle complex is involved in opening of the eye whereas the orbicularis is involved in the eye closure. The components that are involved in the lid motility are orbicularis oculi, the levator and the lower lid retractors. The lower lid does not have a corresponding uh, muscle of the levator and the Müller's but instead they have the lid retractors which serve the function of stabilizing the lower lid. Now these uh, layers in the upper lid are the skin, the orbicularis, the neurovascular plane, levator complex, orbital septum and the tarsal plate as shown. The tarsal plate is suspended on two sides by the canthal tendon and the orbital septum over the entire length and separate the preceptal tissue from the orbit. So it is very important to know that from the orbital, if orbital margin we have orbital septum that connects to the tarsal plate and this tarsal plate along with the orbital septum forms the frame connecting the orbital margin to the tarsal plate. So now this is perforated in between by a levator muscle complex that comes arises from the orbit and around the eyeball and that inserts on the anterior surface of the tarsal plate. Now this when the levator muscle contracts you get the opening of the lid. So this is very very important for us to know. The second part is that the structure Structural stability of the lid comes from the canthal tendons which are formed by the medial and the lateral canthal tendon which insert on the orbital margins. So these canthal tendons are insert on the medial and the lateral side of the tarsal plate. These along with the orbicularis muscle offer the tone and the posture to the lid any problem of which can lead to problems like entropion, ectropion and ptosis. So, the above structure, especially the pretarsal orbicularis, that is the part of the orbicularis in front of the tarsal plate, this is very important for the structural stability of the lid. Again, when it is located near the area of the lacrimal pump, that is the canaliculi medially, this pretarsal orbicularis strip is going to be very important in the functioning of the lacrimal pump, which we will discuss later. Now the drainage of the tears into the lacrimal system is accomplished by an intact drainage pathway as we have said which consists of the canaliculi, the common canaliculus, the lacrimal sac and the NLD. Now any physical or anatomical obstruction to any of these passages can lead to a nasolacrimal block and can lead to tearing. Apart from that if there is a problem with the pretarsal orbicularis or this muscle then there is a deficiency in the lacrimal pump, the tears will not enter the canaliculi and again we will have what we call as a watering eye reflected by a high tear meniscus. Having known this, we will start with the first pathology of the upper lid which is ptosis. Ptosis is nothing but the drooping of the upper eyelid. So the classification of the, or the etiology of the ptosis is mechanical as in lid swellings like calesion, aponeurotic ptosis like involutional and post-surgery. Post or especially post brittle suture, myogenic as in myasthenia and myotonic dystrophy and neurogenic as in Ferdinand palsy and Horner syndrome. It is worthwhile to note that the ptosis in Horner syndrome is always mild and not as severe as in Ferdinand palsy where it is nearly total. Now symptoms of ptosis are narrow palpebral fissure on the side of the ptosis. If this happens at a very early age, it can also lead to amblyopia or stimulus deprivation in small children. Examination of a case of ptosis we need to see the palpebral fissure height, the margin reflex distance, levator function, margin crease distance, Bell's phenomenon, corneal sensations, ocular motility, Marcus Gunn phenomenon and fatigability. Examining all these criteria help us in diagnosing the cause of the ptosis and formulating the management strategy for the same. So the treatment essentially 
of further ptosis in, depends on the severity of the ptosis, the associated phenomena and the neuro, uh, associated neurological findings along with the ptosis. In a very small child, if there is severe ptosis, you need to treat urgently to avoid stimulus deprivation and myopia as it covers the visual axis. The surgical options for ptosis in general include the Fasnella Sarovat surgery or the conjunctival Müllerectomy, especially in cases of Horner syndrome where you have a sympathetic paralysis and the ptosis is mild or in case of mild ptosis in general. The second option is the levator resection where basically you, you are trying to deal with this weak levator muscle and by doing it like any other muscle resection in squint surgery, you resect the part of the muscle commensurate with the weakness and then you elevate the lid to the normal position. The third option is a frontalis ring surgery. In the frontalis ring, it is very important to remember it's usually done bilaterally. The reason being achieving a symmetric result is difficult in doing a unilateral surgery in a frontalis ring. In cases of very severe ptosis and in aberrant regenerations, bilateral ring surgery is mandatory to achieve a good cosmetic result and this is done along with a levator excision. Now let us come to the second pathology which is most common uh, commonly asked in your uh, examinations that is the Calaisian. In Calaisian, it's basically one of the etiology of ptosis. It causes some mechanical ptosis due to its weight. It is a chronic lipogranulomatous swelling of the meibomian glands caused by the blockage of the orifices and stagnation of the secretions. The word lipogranulomatous is very important because it is basically a granulomatous reaction to the lipid which is stagnated inside the tarsal plate as a result of blockage of the meibomian glands. The predisposition to this condition is especially in seboric individuals and people who have skin types who harbor acne. The symptoms of this disease are a painless swelling of the lids which gradually increases in size. It may be pea sized or it may increase to enormous sizes in some individuals. It can affect any age group. Recurrent swellings in the adult occurring at the same site especially after surgical excision need to be treated carefully because they have a chance of harboring a sebaceous cell carcinoma. The treatment options for Calaisian are first in small children with small size swellings they tend to do well even with observation which can disappear over a period of months. And the second option is if the swelling is relatively small and ill defined we can go in for an intraregional steroid injection like triamcinolone. This can lead to rapid resolution of the swelling over a couple of weeks. Despite all these efforts if the swelling increases in size in children especially if it is causing a lot of ptosis or in adults causing a cosmetic problem. The third option is surgery which is called as incision and curatage. What happens basically is this distension of the tarsal plate because of the blockage of the orifice. So this is what is going to happen in the normal state in the Galatia. So what we do is go and incise, put a radial cut perpendicular to the lid margin on the side of the swelling from the inside and then drain the secretions backwards so that there is no lid scar that is produced. The process is called incision and curatage because we curate the internal surface to promote granulation tissue and healing. Now coming to the third important uh, topic in the lids and the adnexa that is conjunctivitis. The word conjunctiva from, com comes from the word conjoin that is because it joins the lid and the globe. Uh, it is very very important for us initially to understand the clinical anatomy and the applied physiology which will help us in understanding the further pathological conditions which we will discuss later. Coming to the clinical anatomy and the applied physiology of the conjunctiva, it is basically a mucous membrane that is lining the undersurface of the lids and the surface of the eye vault in the corneal limbus. Anatomically it consists of three layers that is the epithelium, the adenoid and the fibrous. The important point to note in this is that the adenoid layer is containing the lymphatic tissue and this lymphatic tissue is uh, most developed in the fornix and the subtarsal region. So any medical condition that affects the lymphatic tissue like an allergic response or uh, hypersensitivity is going to lead to changes in this particular uh, area of the conjunctiva and we will see pathological changes which are related to this area. The third important uh, point about the conjunctiva is the glands which are the mucin producing goblet cells and the accessory lacrimal glands. Goblet cells are spread all over the conjunctiva with the maximum density in the nasal bulbar conjunctiva and the inferior fornix. The mucin is responsible for lowering the surface tension of the, and giving the stability to the tear film and the important part about this mucin is besides giving a stability to the tear film it is 
see the goblet cell density changes in case of vitamin A deficiency where it goes low because of which you get a dry eye and it is increased in cases of inflammation where overproduction of mucus can lead to ropey secretions as in allergic conjunctivitis. Lymphatics in the conjunctiva are arranged in two layers. The medial side of the conjunctiva drains to the submandibular nodes whereas the temporal side drains to the periauricular nodes. This particularly gives rise to a painful adenopathy in case of viral conjunctivitis. Also, it can lead to uh, adenopathy in case of granulomatous conjunctivitis. Lymphoid aggregates associated with the MALT or the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue of the gut and the bronchus are also found in the conjunctiva which explains conjunctivitis as a part of multisystem disease. Now coming to the first or the rather the most important type of conjunctivitis in terms of its incidence as well as in terms of the exams that is the vernal conjunctivitis of the spring catar. In vernal conjunctivitis it is a bilateral recurrent interstitial inflammation of the conjunctiva with periodic seasonal recurrence. The etiology being idiopathic, it is cause is not known and hence the treatment is very difficult. The only good part about this condition that it is relatively self-limited and it passes up on its own. The age group for this condition is 6 to 20 years but can occur earlier and by, by and large it remits by the late teens. The symptoms are recurrent attacks of intense itching which is very very important to know. Itching is the hallmark of any form of allergy and hence itching is the most important symptom and omnipresent in cases of vernal conjunctivitis. Besides this, recurrent redness, ropey discharge and tearing and photophobia are also important signs. The important signs which are very frequently discussed and pathognomonic of this one condition are Trantas dots which are chalky white uh, deposits at the limbus which are atop gelatinous, uh, gelatinous aggregates at the limbus. There is cobblestone papillary hypertrophy of the conjunctiva which is unique to this particular condition. Mucus debris, punctate epithelial erosions and in severe cases shield ulcers and dry eyes. All these follow a single spectrum of excessive production of mucus, uh, inflammatory chemicals leading to corneal erosions which then coalesce to form a shield ulcer. So they form entirely one particular spectrum. It's very easy to understand. As you can see in this particular figure, this is the papillary hypertrophy which is a reactive hypertrophy in normal individuals seen in all cases like conjunctivitis or any routine irritative condition of the eye. Whereas on the right hand side you have the cobblestone hypertrophy of vernal conjunctivitis where you have large papillae appearing like cobblestones besides each other. This is a very classical feature seen only in this one condition. It's very very important to know. Associations of this particular condition are with keratoconus, corneal opacification and pseudogerontoxon. Pseudogerontoxon is basically an arc-like opacification of the superior cornea due to the peculiar location of the inflammation more in that particular region. The histology of the cobblestone papillae are intense collagen proliferation with accumulation of ground substance. Now this is relatively difficult to reverse and once deposited they are very very less chance that it may return to a normal conjunctival phenotype. Conjunctiva is laden in these cases with mast cells and trantas dots contain eosinophils surrounded by degenerated cellular debris. So all in all a hyperreactive allergic response. The most important differential diagnosis in this case is trachoma which is also very very common in uh, semi-arid regions and poor economic socio-economic status in India. The most important difference being the size of the follicles in the upper tarsal conjunctiva which is not present in cases of spring cutter. Follicles in UTC, especially giant follicles more than a millimeter or two are classical and pathognomonic of trachoma. The treatment of uh, spring cutter essentially consists of medical therapy and surgical therapy. The medical therapy starts with the basic drugs like mast cell stabilizers. Although described as the first line of treatment, they are mostly prophylactic in nature and should be given before the onset of an attack. Very limited use once the, there is a, the attack of conjunctivitis has begun. They are consist of olopatadine, chromoline sodium group of drugs and they are more as a prophylactic. Topical steroids are the uh, hallmark of the treatment and they are the treatment in established disease. This is basically the risky part of the whole process where in case the patient is a steroid responder, because of the recurrent treatment, he can lead to steroid induced glaucoma, which can be really difficult to treat in some cases. The third option is our immunomodulators, which include topical cyclosporin, 0.5 or 1%, which can be used in cases of steroid responders, or they can be used 
in case uh, for steroid sparing just in case to prevent the side effects of long term use of topical steroids the final last but not the least is treatment of complications that is the shield ulcers these as we told you forms as a result of a lot of inflammation on the surface of the cornea forming recurrent corneal erosions the mucus uh, debris on top of that tract leading to uh, formation of shield ulcers debridement of these ulcers with multilayer or unilayer amniotic membrane transplantation or amniotic membrane grafting can lead to a good healing and prevent scarring of the cornea yeah. now we come to the lacrimal system again we start in a similar fashion like we did for all the topics i start with the, uh, the clinical anatomy and the applied physiology of the lacrimal system which is basically a system for the secretion and the drainage of the tears after production from the main lacrimal glands as shown here these are emptied into the superior fornix with the help of uh, lacrimal ducts and then the tear film flows over the eye into the tear meniscus which can be drained by two canaliculi the upper and the lower one from the upper and the lower canaliculi it reaches the common canaliculus and then the lacrimal sac from the lacrimal sac by gravitation these are drained into the inferior meatus of the nose the effective drainage requires intact passages that is all these passages right from the punctum to the canaliculi to the common canaliculus and the nld need to be treated so also the ostium of the nld in the inferior meatus apart from that it needs effective functioning of the pretarsal orbicularis as we had already told you that is forming the part of the lacrimal pump blockage most commonly in these cases leads to epiphora and is located at the level of the nasal lacrimal duct inferiorly this can lead to stagnation of the secretions and overflow these secretions can get infected and leading to inflammation in the lacrimal sac which is called as lacrimal cystitis it can also occur at the level of the common canaliculus and the individual canaliculi at variable lengths so the obstructions can places of obstruction can be here at the common canaliculus at the individual canaliculi testing the lacrimal passages hence becomes very important to know the site of the obstruction so that the treatment is facilitated the testing of the lacrimal passages is done by the probe test in the probe test a metallic probe is passed after dilatation of the punctum through through the canaliculus if all the passages proximally are patent the, the probe is going to hit the bone just behind the lacrimal sac in the lacrimal fossa because of this hard bone behind it is going to give you something called as a hard stop in these cases of a hard stop we are sure that the passages are patent till the uh, point from the punctum to the lacrimal sac clinical cor uh, corollary to that is in case a pressure on the sac gives a reflux of discharge into the conjunctiva it means the same thing as a positive probe test giving a hard stop in in case it abuts a soft tissue then we know it is for sure not the bone it can be one at the individual canaliculus or at the common canaliculus now depending upon the length of the probe that is inside the canaliculus we can make out the possible point of obstruction and the differentiation is done by the syringing test so probe test plus the syringing will give you exact location of obstruction in the canaliculus in the syringing test we can corroborate the findings of the probe test in case of a common canalicular block we would draw the diagram again to understand in case of a common canalicular block we once we do a syringing from this end it is going to immediately pass off from the upper canaliculus so it is going to lead to a fast regurgitation from the opposite side pressure on the sac in such cases is not going to lead to a reflux into the conjunctiva so pressure on the sac test will be negative whereas there will be fast regurgitation from the opposite punctum whereas if there is obstruction at the nld the fluid is going to pass make currents into the sac and then it is going to flow out through the opposite canaliculus so it is going to be the slow regurgitation from the opposite punctum now syringing with the probe test are basically going to locate you the point of obstruction and if the above two tests are normal and there is still there is tearing then we need to look at the functional cause or the function of the lacrimal pump the two tests that tell us the function of the lacrimal pump are the fluorescein dye disappearance test and the dichrocentigraphy in the fddt or the fluorescein dye disappearance test a drop of fluorescein is instilled in the lacrimal cul-de-sac or conjunctival cul-de-sac and the time for disappearance into the canalicular system is noted if it is greater than 2 minutes or 2 to 3 minutes it is considered as abnormal and a functional component needs to be looked at in case of fddt the findings are not found to be very convincing we can go ahead and do a dichrocentigraphy 
which involves a radio isotope testing. A radio isotope mixed with an eyedrop is installed in the cul de sac, and with a gamma camera, the activity is measured as it passes down the lacrimal passages. So, depending upon the location of the radio tracer, post installation, you can find out the site of the block, and in functional blocks, we would find out that there is a decreased drainage because of the inability of the lacrimal pump to clear this dye into the patent lacrimal system. Now coming to acquired nasal lacrimal duct obstruction which is by far the most common clinical presentation we get in practice. There are various causes of acquired nasal lacrimal duct obstruction, the most common being idiopathic. The other causes are trauma, irradiation and infiltration. Infiltration by nasopharyngeal carcinomas and nasopharyngeal tumors are the common causes of acquired obstruction in case of malignancies. The symptoms in these cases will be because of the obstruction at the NLD, you get a proximal dilatation of the system and hence you will get a swelling in the region of the lacrimal sac. Because of the inability to drain, we may get a high tear film and watering. And because of the stagnation, the contents tend to get infected and we may get presence of a chronic discharging red eye. The signs as we discussed previously will be a visible sac swelling, regurgitation on pressure as we had previously discussed. On pressure on the sac, you will get regurgitation of mucus or mucopus into the conjunctival sac. And syringing will only give us slow regurg from the opposite punctum because of the currents produced, the time taken for the regurg to come out will be more. The treatment in these cases involves basically a dacrocystor rhinostomy in which we create an artificial passage or a new passage from the sac to the nasal, nasal cavity into the middle meatus. It is essentially done by punching the intervening lacrimal bone and opening the lacrimal sac into nasal cavity, the anastomosis can be created or it can just be left open depending upon the technique used. The two techniques used for dacrocystor rhinostomy commonly are the external which involves the incision on the skin and the endoscopic which does not involve a skin incision which can be done through the nose generally with the help of a nasal endoscope. The third technique which is common is called as a laser DCR in which a diode laser is used to perforate the bone instead of using the, the bone punches. The next important rather very important topic is congenital nasal lacrimal duct obstruction or rather a failure of canalization of the NLD. Now this can be present at birth this obstruction or the so called failure of canalization because normally the canalization takes place sometime after birth. Now the signs in this particular case are watering matting of the lashes and reflux on pressure on the sac as we discussed in acquired cases of nasolacrimal duct obstruction. The important thing to remember in these cases however is in case of a watering eye in a newborn it is very important to rule out a congenital glaucoma which will be suggested by the diameter of the cornea and the corneal clarity. In case that is a problem it is mandatory to do an examination under anesthesia and rule out that as a cause of watering. In these cases however you will not get any pressure on regurgitation or regurgitation on pressure on the sac. The treatment of this is essentially medical. 95% of these cases resolve on their own and by you know, a lacrimal massage. In cases which do not respond to lacrimal massage after a period of one year, the probing under general anesthesia is done. In these cases, you pass a metallic probe from the upper canaliculus under general anesthesia, move it around and pass it, push it down the nasal lacrimal duct into the inferior meatus. By doing this, you are opening the physiological opening of the nasolacrimal duct and facilitating the drainage of tears. In case it doesn't work for one time, it can be repeated a second time after a few months. And if it still does not work or if fibrosis is down, then you can put a silastic intubation which is bicanalicular in which we put a stent with the help of two, two metal probes into the nasal cavity and tie them and keep the stent in place to keep the passage patent. Now if this also fails then at the age of 3 to 4 years we go in for an external DCR or dacrocystor rhinostomy the way we do it for an adult case or acquired case of nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. The age of 3 to 4 years is very important because that is the age till which the facial skeleton is fully developed and interfering or punching the bone will not lead to any specific anatomical abnormality in the child. In this uh, particular module on the lids and the lacrimal system we have learnt about certain diseases or the very important diseases of the lids like dosis, the important disease of conjunctivitis or spring catar and nasolacrimal duct obstruction like the congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction 
the acquired nasolacrimal duct obstruction and its treatment. It is very very important to understand that clinical correlation is the key to remembering any subject. So the clinical anatomy and applied physiology are very very important in understanding the topic. And I stress in these cases that by doing so it is very easy to remember the subject instead of reading books without understanding them.